kosher food is that you don't mix milk and meat in the same meal. So there's some obvious um, kind of um, more logical reasons why this might be true. But I kept thinking, is this really true or is this something that people made up? Um, like each of the major practices, I really felt like I wanted to know if it was based on truth before I put my heart into it. Sure. So, um, so when you have a kosher kitchen, then you have typically a sink for dairy things and um, the place to put the dishes for the dairy dishes, when you, where you um, like the dish rack, and then you have in a sponge, and then you have your other side for meat, so that you can keep things separate. And Which so also costs, I suppose, a bit of money to have two sets of everything. Um, so, so, um, I mean, you know, dish racks, or okay. plastic, and... Two sinks. Uh, well, uh, th in America it's pretty common. Okay. In Israel sometimes you only find one, and there's ways to get around it. Okay. There's things that you can do. But um, I um, then, so as I was putting one of the sponge holders in place, when I finished, it was like the last thing I had to do for the kosher kitchen. The same thing happened to me that happened to me when I bought mm -hmm. the kosher food. I felt again this kind of light come down and <laughs> this sort of magical feeling all of a sudden. And I thought, wow, this is real. This is true. This is true also. This is based on truth. And um, then my ki my kitchen was all kosher, and I sat at my table and I looked at it, and I just felt it was somehow like elevated or something. I really felt like it just felt like whoa. <laughs> uh, you know, I I started wearing um, what are called tefillin sometimes lately, oh, nice. which are the, the black boxes mm. with the letter shin on the arm and on the forehead. And I, I could say I felt something like that as well. Oh, I can tell you something about those. Um, I actually learned when I was in Kabad, um, I think a fellow oh, student brought it. It's in something the men do, the women don't, yeah. yes. Um, somebody, I don't know if it was the rabbi or someone else, but someone brought an article that showed that where you put the tefillin um, on these different points, that there are points that correspond in Chinese medicine for um, points that, um, acupuncture points that correspond to places that will help you go into meditation. So it's very interesting how and, truth and shows up in And the a Jewish man will wear these things when he wants to go into meditation. Yeah, when words, he's saying when he's praying, praying uh -huh. or when he wants to meditate even. So yeah. um Yeah, so it's very interesting. It's it's it has been very powerful for me. Um a little side well, it's not a side thing. What is the point? I mean I I like what Shalom said about the the, the Jewish commandments uh -huh. or the mitzvot, that it's like a an energy law. It's, it's. How would you describe it? Oh, I remember it, because um, he might have been quoting our Kabbalah teacher. He was. Which I remember this um, talk very vividly. That one night he started talking to us about these um, threads that come down from the higher worlds with divine energy, and he said, and these threads are called mitzvot. And so that's the commandments. You know, like keeping kosher and observing Shabbat. So and these things. So you activate. And open the threads by following this yeah. practice. You're um, basically, I think, um, the the um, the responsibility as a Jewish person is that we're we're being used to channel divine energy into the world, and then from there it goes out and Hopefully. supplies yeah <laughs> supplies the world. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. Often it's very very the opposite sometimes. Yeah, but, but uh, it's. Yeah, uh, but okay. I mean, you know, that's, uh, I don't know. That's life, they, that's yeah, the world. And it's, that's, that's the intention when they say uh, people of light, um, I suppose it's your, if you want to put it in really simple terms, I might say like a faucet, you know, like you're a, a pipeline or something, that it's spread. No, I'm sure there are, there are threads, all different threads from different practices, mm. like in the Tao, the Taoists have their threads and the Hindus have their threads. And yeah, that's why there are different uh, spiritual paths and people have different practices. Um, you know, it just depends what's appropriate for, for each, uh, for each, each person. person. Yeah, so. Okay. So let's see, where were we in the you story? Are, so okay, so I was talking about yeah, the kosher food and things like this. So um, um, I asked Hashem, uh, I asked God, what do you want me to do with my life this time? And um, what's interesting thinking back is he didn't tell me, you know, yes or no. He showed me the truth in the practices. And then um, I chose. I chose because I saw the truth in it. So that was very interesting that uh, he kind of stood back and, and let me choose. Maybe that was an important part. And 
Why did you? I mean, many people, Jew, religious Jews, never think of coming to Israel. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a tough step. Yeah. Um, why did you take that one on? Okay. Um, well, first I'll throw in the story um, of the temple, which happened before my conversion. Oh well, tell us that. And story. then the temple happened right before the message to to immigrate to Israel. So let's hear that. Okay. I, amazing story. Yeah. Um. Yeah. It was it's such a gem for me that this experience. I uh, I appreciate this gift from God, and I just cherish it. So um, I went. Uh, well, I came to Israel. Um, to see what Israel is, because in the Jewish prayers we talk a lot about Israel and mm -hmm. you know um, say high things about Israel. And I thought, you know, how can I pray for my heart if I don't really know what Israel is, you know? Yeah. So I decided to come to Israel. Zion, Zion Jerusalem, yeah. Israel. So I decided to come for a few weeks in um, about a month, uh, a certain summer. And typically my kids would stay with my mother, who's a teacher. So I had uh, time to come. So I came and I decided to study Hebrew language for that month. And um, while I was here, I met some friends, and um, one of them was um, Ruben um, Ruben Halevi, and he's a mystical tour guide in the Old City. Okay. So he offered um, to take me on a tour to um, to the South Wall of the temple. So most people are familiar with the Wailing Wall, which is the Western Wall. That's right. But if you go through the what's called the archaeological park, then you can go to the South Wall. Okay. So um, he said, we'll go there. And um, so, you know, it sounded interesting. So before we went, he told us some things about the temple, um, just some basics. But uh, the interesting thing was that when I went, I didn't know anything about the temple. I had never studied it or seen photos of, or, um, not photos, but maybe drawings of how it was. Um, so I really didn't know very much about it. So he told us some things, but uh, interestingly enough, he didn't show us any um, visual drawings or anything, okay. which, which is significant to the story to me. <coughs> so he brought us to the South Wall, which was originally the entrance back then when the temple existed, was the entrance to the temple. And as we started to climb the, the ancient stone of the stairs, then Ruben said, uh, he said, just um, go up the stairs very um, like quietly and just remember that once your feet were here before in the past. And mm. that was very nice. Uh, the the steps are still there? Um, I think they are. I mean, what? I don't know how far back they go, but the stone is ancient as you go up these steps. Okay. Yeah. So then we got, you know, you go up some steps and then you're at the, there's like a whatever platform, and then you're at the wall. Um, the wall, which uh, is where the entrance was, where the archways, which are closed up right now. So then uh, Ruben told us, because uh, I went with a couple, with another friend, and I said, uh, he said, um, find a place along the wall that just feels like your little place, like where you should stand right now for meditation. So uh, each of us, we went and we found our little place. And then uh, I found this little place that just felt like a little niche where my face uh, just fit. And um, so he said, okay, so just, you know, allow yourself to go into meditation and ask Hashem to bring you into the temple. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> okay, let's see if, if this happens. So um, it was in August, and it was really hot, and the south wall is not so far away from where the traffic comes in. Um, it's that area. So it, it was hot, and I felt sweaty, and uh, I heard all the traffic, and I heard honking, and I thought, how can I go into meditation, you know? So um, I started to um, just um, ask God for help. I said, you know, help me out here. <laughs> I can't, like, focus. And um, then I thought, and then all of a sudden it popped into my mind um, something I had done that seemed like, like it was a little bit boastful, like a little bit of pride that I had done that, that something I had said that morning. And I thought, oh my gosh, here I was on my way to the temple, and I did this thing, and uh, I'm so embarrassed that I did this. And I said, Hashem, please forgive me for doing that ridiculous thing. And I was on my way to the temple, like, you know, maybe it's blocking me now, you know, it was, I shouldn't have done that. So um, I waited and I waited. And then I said something that was, I don't know, sounded maybe like a little girl, and then I. I really wanted to take advantage of this opportunity, so I said, 
Will you please let me go inside the temple just because you love me? Uh, <laughs> no, it doesn't sound like a little girl. Uh, I don't no, know where I, it came from. Like. That's a beautiful prayer. <laughs> so then, um, with that, I started to see this long hallway. Mm. And um, I don't know, if, uh, up to then, I don't think I ever had this sort of meditation before that was. Like, um, you know, I've had meditations where you connect and you see light or maybe you get some sort of vision. But this virtual reality type thing where I could like walk around and stuff and see things, that never happened to me before and that's what started to happen now. So I saw this long hallway and I had read in meditation books that if you see something like a hallway or a door, to like, like follow it. So I thought, oh, okay, let me try this, you know. So I... I like followed down that hallway and it was a really really long hallway and then on the way I started to see some Hebrew letters going by you know Whoa. like at the top of the walls or something and then um, I came out into an area um, and then um, I remember after going through this long 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 hallway and then I saw some light at the end of the tunnel <laughs> the light at the end of the tunnel so I came out and I thought wow here there's roof and here there's no roof there's no roof and here there's roof. Wow, that's really weird. I wonder why there's some roof here and there's no roof there. So I looked where there was no roof and then I saw the altar of the temple. Oh, wow. Yeah, and apparently there was roof where the people would stand and then it was open because they would do uh, the fires. So, so I looked at the, I looked at the altar and um, I, I thought, oh, I don't want to see the animal sacrifices, you know. And so I don't know if Hashem didn't show me that because... I was like a little squeamish about it or if um, some people have the theory that when the third temple comes that there won't be animal sacrifices. Right, that's what I so, do. Yeah, so in either case I didn't see it and so now I don't know if I was seeing the future or the past because I didn't see But animals. you saw the temple? But I saw the, I saw the um, altar and the high priest and I saw a column of light coming down to the Whoa. altar. Whoa. So then, um, you didn't just see it; you were in it. Yeah, I was. I was there, I guess. So then, um, I, I I looked back over at the people, and what I noticed was that everyone there was completely present. You know, it's just where do you see? Where do you ever experience that? Everyone was completely present. Nowhere. Yeah, not not on Earth. <laughs> and um, in addition, there was this complete silence. But it was like a rich silence. The only way I could describe it. A very rich silence and everyone completely present. So amazing. So then um, I looked back to the altar and now I saw smoke going up, a column of smoke going up. So then I decided to look around a little more and I remember seeing, I looked up on the ceiling and I saw these multi-pointed um, stars uh -huh. like that were I think I actually walked to another little area for a little bit. I saw these multi-pointed stars, which I don't know what they are yet. Maybe I'll find out someday. And then, so then I came back to the altar, and then I looked one more time, and now what I saw was a column of fire rain. So it looked like rain, but it was fire. So um, then I thought, well, I've been in here for a while, and maybe it's time to go and to accept this gift and not, you know, not stay any longer. So then, um, you know, I came back out. And you know what the amazing thing was, too? Um, when I went in, I didn't hear the traffic and feel the yeah, sun or anything I'm anymore. Sure. Which, what, that's so amazing to me. Because even when I med meditate, you know, you can usually hear little sounds and things around. And, but I didn't hear anything when I was in there. So then um, we came out of our meditation and my friend also had an amazing experience, um, different from mine, but a few things similar. And then um, the tour guide said, um, oh, do you want to go here? you want to go see this and that? And we both said, hold on a minute. <laughs> we need to like, we need to like just be still for a minute and, and kind of digest what just happened to us. And maybe we need to talk about it a little bit. So um, we each shared our experiences with each other to, um, you know, to really, I guess, uh, embrace it and make it concrete or whatever in our in our own minds. So um, I started to tell Ruben about what I saw step by step. You know, the hallway and this and and the roof and the no roof. And he said, so far everything that you're saying is completely architecturally 
Correct. And I said, are you kidding? Are you kidding? He said, no. When we go back to my place after, I'll show you pictures. I'll show you drawings. And so um, we did go back to his place after, um, after we were, you know, when we were ready. And he showed me the drawings of how the, um, the era of the altar and how the temple was. And it was exactly what I saw. I was like, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I saw. And I was like so amazed uh, to have that experience. Yes, as you should be. Yeah, and so um, I was so glad that I, that I hadn't seen it beforehand because then I might have thought that I was like imagining yes. or remembering or something, but I had no idea. So that was, it was really special to see it afterwards and say, oh my gosh, this is what I saw. And I had no previous idea of what it was like. So in that same trip, Wait, wait. Was you want he, more questions? About was he um, surprised when you said to him that you had actually been in the temple, as it, as if it's still physically existing? Did that, did that uh, shock him? Or well, he's think? a mystical tour guide, so I think he's heard all kinds of experiences from a lot of different people. That's what I would imagine. Okay. Yeah, I didn't seem as shocked as most of us would be. <laughs> um, but he didn't say if he had been there himself. Um, no, I don't. I know he's had a lot of different experiences, so maybe, maybe. Okay. I know he's he's had a lot of different experiences himself. So okay. Yeah. Sounds like an interesting guy. You yeah. Wanna plug his name again in case. Oh uh, yeah, Ruven Halevi. Okay. In the old city. Okay. Yes. Um, a very sweet guy, very sincere. He always has wonderful stories to tell, uh, to uplift you and uh, inspire you. So. It's very unusual. The way, yeah. The way he works. And, um, yeah. Anyway, if yeah. I'm gonna go to. If I were going to take a trip like that, I'd want to speak with him. Yeah, yeah, he's good. Okay. So, anyway, next. Next. So, I was coming to the end of that month when I first came, and I was almost finished with my Hebrew classes. And um, I, one thing I enjoyed about Yerushalayim was that you can walk everywhere. You know, like, uh, when I lived in Phoenix, it's really hot, and things are really spread out, and you just don't walk. You just don't walk on the streets, you know. You always go by car everywhere. So I thought it was really nice to be walking back to my apartment. And as I was walking, I was thinking, oh, it's, it's so nice to walk here. And and I thought, you know, I'm really starting to feel sort of at home here in Jerusalem. I thought, wow, yeah, yeah, I yeah. am. <laughs> and I was walking by the president's house, you know, yes. like uh, kind of like Where Bahavia. Siobhan Perez, who was our president, mm -hmm. uh, lives. Yeah. yeah. So I always remember I was walking um, by his house, so I remember the spot. And nowadays when I pass it by bus, I acknowledge this spot. Because um, I started to think, wow, how would I ever know if I should move to Israel if I'm way over in Phoenix? Like, how could I know? How could I make that decision? Such a big decision. And how would I know that it's the right thing? And so I was like thinking and I was thinking and um, just contemplating it the whole way home. Wow, how would I know? And how could I be sure? So then I got back to my little apartment and I sat down and I felt like, whoosh, this message came through me to move to Israel. Okay. And all these tears came out, <laughs> big time tears, because, you know, like I told you, when I, when I uh, hear or see something true, I get tears, but when it's something big like this, then it's, it's a lot. So I was like, whoosh. So then um, I had a laptop computer open on the table, and in that moment I walked over to the computer, and um, apparently my family had tried to Skype me a few minutes before I got home, and so instead they left a little um, typewritten message, a little Skype text. And so I looked at the Skype message, and what it said in that exact moment when I was receiving this message, my mother had typed, now I understand Avraham. Uh, <laughs> right in that uh, moment, he was see, told by God <laughs> to leave his country and come to wait, this see, land. That's that. That's the code of it. Now I understand Abraham. Uh, first, I, I don't know. I'll ask you soon why your mother said it. But but yeah. now, but you were understanding Abraham at that time with this with these big tears. Yeah. You are understanding what motivated Abraham to leave the land yeah. of his parents and his ancestors and go to a completely strange place um, and put everything on the line. Yeah. Because that's uh, that was his guidance. You are understanding him exactly. Yeah. And your mother writes the, exa the, the phrase <laughs> which is exactly coded to what you're going through. Yeah. What did your mother mean by that? 
Well, that's what I wanted to find out. So I called them on Skype, and I talked to my daughters for a few minutes, and then I said, um, hey, I just got this message from Nana before I talked to you, and I wanted to know what her message means. So I didn't tell her what was happening with me, and plus she's not Jewish, and she's also not religious. She's an artist, so she's pretty intuitive sometimes, but not a religious person, right. really, or spiritual person, per se. Um, so even more interesting, the message comes from her. That's a very unusual <laughs> message. Yeah. <clears throat> so then um, I said, hey, ask Nana what, what's the meaning of that message that she typed to me. And so um, she said, uh, she came over and she sat down and she said, I don't know what it means. It's a cryptic message. Oh my I only know that I'm supposed to tell it to you. Oh my goodness. <laughs> That is incredible. Yeah, and then she says, the only other thing that I know that I'm supposed to tell you is put God first. Oh! <laughs> Can you imagine? Oh my God. Right in the middle of receiving this message. Yeah, so That's pretty amazing. Incredible. Then I wanted to make Aliyah like immediately, you know, because I was like so overjoyed, you know. But um, my, I was still waiting to get the date for my conversion, which you have to go to a Jewish court. And uh, it's very challenging to become Jewish because, um, again, they don't recruit people. And, um, and it's not easy. It's not easy. They, they want to be sure that you, you really want to do this. And so they, they make a lot of uh, challenges and obstacles because they want to see if you, if you really, really, if this is coming from your soul or if you have any uh, ulterior motives, like you're planning to marry someone Jewish or blah, 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 whatever. Yes. So they make it difficult. So you know. This is about... Uh, an orthodox halachic. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, okay. um, I, I hadn't even had my court date yet. It was coming in a few months. And so, um, I, you know, I wanted to come, but there's a law in Israel that you can't uh, immigrate or make aliyah until you've been Jewish for a year. And your congregation and your rabbi has kept an eye on you and seen that you're really sincere and mm -hmm. things like this. So, uh, it's, it's a process. But, um, and then I thought, oh my gosh, how can I wait a year? It's going to be so slow, and how can I stand it? Because when I first went back to America, it was so weird. I felt like my spirit was being stretched across the world, and I felt like my spirit was here, and it's like my body was left in Phoenix. I felt like I was being stretched, and like my spirit was all like, or maybe it stayed behind or something. Uh -huh. I really felt like sort of stretched. And then I thought, can I like walk around like this like for a whole year, like waiting to waiting to uh, make Aliyah. So um, it actually took, I think, uh, I th it maybe even might have been uh, more than a year until everything was completed. So um, then when I when I got back to Phoenix, I told my mentor of Chinese medicine about my experiences, and of course he was amazed. And then he added one thing. He said, well, when you receive a message like this, it's really important uh, to consider the timing. Like, you got this message, is the time, you know, soon? Or is it a couple of years from now? Like, um, the timing that we do things is very important. And I was like, oh yeah, that's a good point. Yes, it is. So, um, I, um, you know, I just continued my daily life and um, was putting a lot of effort into my healing practice and starting to do a lot of the infertility work and things like that. And I um, started to work with this really nice um, upscale women's fertility clinic in, in um, Scottsdale and uh, things were going pretty well and so then I thought well things are going pretty well so uh, <laughs> maybe uh, the time's not yet yeah. you know? so um, I, I thought well I'll just ask God to let me know <laughs> when the time is right you know send me a sign whatever so um, I went about my life and then um, after I had been working at this clinic for about a year we got into the cold and flu season, and I got a really bad flu, and I missed a couple of days of work maybe, and another one, I missed a few days of work, and then I got a really, really bad flu, and mm -hmm. it knocked me out for like three weeks, and I like, Whoa. I was afraid I was going to lose my job because, you know, they had to reschedule people, and it was very inconvenient, so I was really upset, uh, like that I kept getting knocked out of commission, plus um, my alimony was about to expire. And then I just took a look at my life, and I thought, um, and, my, and my, my home practice also, um, even though after that I started to get a little bit better, and where I could work, but then I had almost no appointments at the clinic, and almost no appointments at my home office, 
and my alimony was running out and I wasn't having work. And then I started thinking, you know what, a lot of my friends have moved away or moved to other places in the city and I kind of feel like I, I don't have friends right now. And I started to think, wow, like my life is shut down in like all major areas. Yes. And from our teacher, our Kabbal teacher, we had learned that when this happens, you need to stop and say, wait a second, somehow I'm off my path because I'm disconnected from the flow yes. and everything's closing down. So I, I called my friend Shalom and I said, will you meet me for dinner because I need to talk to you. So he said, okay. So I said, Shalom, what do you see with my life? And I was just there complaining like, you know, my health and my work and my money and my friends and like everything's like shut down. Like I know this must mean something. And I know a lot of times it's easier for other people to see things going on with us than us who are caught in all the emotions and fear and sure. all that stuff. So then um, Shalom got his wisdom face that he gets when he connects, you know. And you know, you know something like really inspired is coming through him. So he said, I see your life like Jonah and the whale. Oh, I was just thinking of Jonah and the whale. Really? Right now? Yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. As you were telling the yeah. story. So he said, I said, well, what do you mean by that, you know? And he said, well, you were given a very clear message to make Aliyah, no doubt about it, to come to Israel. And you're not doing anything. You're not applying, you know, you're not like packing up your house. You're doing nothing. And so now you're in the dark belly of the well. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So <clears throat> as he said this, you know, I just sat and I contemplated for a second. And then I was like, I could feel the truth of it. <coughs> and then when I realized it, I felt like my life force started like coming back into me, like somebody blowing up a balloon again. And I just felt, seriously, I felt like I had been like, and like somebody like plugged me back in or something. And I just felt like, like life force starting to flow back into my body. Just in that minute, that, that, those few moments. And it just continued and continued. So that evening after the dinner, we were planning to go to our um, Kabbalah class. So I went to class and I was, by now I was just like so sure, like maybe like 30 minutes or more had gone by and I was just filled with like the knowledge of this truth that when he was saying that it was like, yeah, I get it. So after class, um, this uh, friend came up to me that I hadn't seen for a while and instead of saying, oh, hi, how are you? He said, aren't you moving to Israel? <laughs> and I said, well, why, why do you ask me that instead of how, how am I? Like, that's, that's kind of strange. He said, I don't know, it just popped into my <laughs> mind. <laughs> and I said, well, actually I am as of like an hour ago. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of a cute little um, confirmation Whoa. of, of uh, the message. So a couple of things um, I thought maybe we could close with. Um, and uh, one is, who and what is Hashem for you? Yeah. A and, then, and then we'll talk about how it's been since you've got here. Okay. Okay? Um, yeah, well, sometimes lately I've described Hashem as my knight in shining armor. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, you, you yeah. Once you used the phrase with me, he's an old sock. He's an old softy. Oh, okay, yeah. So, yeah. Um, how yeah. do you... Um, integrate these statements. Yeah, well, um, when I was really ill and I was in severe pain for several years with different things that I had, um, and I was really contemplating and working um, the issues that were behind the illnesses, which chronic illnesses tend to be associated with uh, certain emotions. And there are even reference books that can help you to realize which emotions they are, or you can consult with intuitive people. But I was really, really working these issues and um, trying to um, to work them actively and bring them out. And oh, it was like, yeah, gnarly. <laughs> so, but sometimes the pain was really, really severe. And um, sometimes I even got upset with God because I was like, oh, it's too much pain. It's too much pain. You know, how how can you even create this much pain on earth? You know, and I would get upset. But um, if I got really, really desperate and I really, really felt like I couldn't handle things, um, I would just kind of sometimes get in a fetal position and just cry to God like a baby, you know. And um, things would shift, you know. Things wow. Would shift. Things would shift. Wow. So, um, 
I can tell you my other story. Did I tell you my story about kicking the bathtub? Let's hear it again. <laughs> well, um, when I started to take steps to apply for immigration, there again, there's a lot of steps, a lot of documents that you have to get. And um, since I realized that the time is now to make Aliyah, um, I kind of like, I looked at the possible dates when I could come because they have dates when they bring groups of people over. So I looked at the dates and I just kind of intuitively felt like July 25th. It just like felt like that's the right date. And it was like April. So it was a little, uh, that was going to be kind of a short amount of time to get things all together. And so I asked the, the people, the, the officials, I said, can I do this? And they're like, well, if you get everything in really soon, then it might be possible. So um, every document that I had to get, um, I was getting them faster than seemed humanly possible. They have this new thing Whoa. in America called a long form birth certificate, mm -hmm. which, you know, like nobody had ever heard of it before. And we had to get this document and all kinds of things. But I also had to get this thing called an apostille, which is a document from the Department of State of you can get it in any state, and it proves that your documents are valid and real. So who has heard of that before? Almost nobody. Yep. And you have to get these documents, find out where, blah, blah, blah. So, but anyway, everything was coming through really quickly at the speed of light, and all of this was very encouraging, you know, just reinforcing that, yeah, now's the time. There was one document that was very difficult for me to get, though. Um, my ex-husband, um, I had to get his permission to bring my daughter, even though I have um, sole custody, which I was surprised because I thought once I had sole custody that that was good for everything. But uh, for the immigration to Israel, it wasn't enough. I had to have written permission from him that I could take my daughter, 14 years old, with me to Israel. So I told him the experience with the message on the computer and all these things. and. Um, he wasn't too happy about uh, me taking her, so he put up a lot of resistance and we were like having these email arguments and time was going on and on and it was unpleasant. And so then I just, I got mad at God and I said, look, this is your plan. I'm going along with it. You need to get me that document. Come on. And I said, this has been really unpleasant for weeks and weeks. And I got so mad, I kicked the bathtub and I left a black mark on the bathtub with my shoe. And I said, and I'm leaving that black mark there so you don't forget how mad I am. And you know, like this is really unpleasant and I'm getting like insulted by these emails. And just, I need you to get me the document. There's your plan, you get the document. And make it snappy. <laughs> so I was really bad. And then about like two days later, my ex-husband um, emailed me and he said, well, I'm not really in agreement with you taking her to Israel, but I signed the document and I mailed it yesterday. And I said, thank you, that's much better. <laughs> wow. Well, but you know, when, when you tell me all of these stories, especially that one, and um, it, uh, it reminds me of a, sort of the relationship of a, of a of a prophet described in the Torah or the Old Testament. You know, they would talk with God, and God would talk with them, and very, very few people have that kind of uh, relationship with God in the modern age, and uh, maybe it's coming back now. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah. And, and, and it, it makes me think that you have a very, very special thing to do here. I'm sure of it. Uh, I think when you had the vision of being in the temple when you were taken in the temple. Yeah. It was an initiation. Oh, and, um, interesting idea. And even the name oh. Hannah that you've chosen for yourself. Oh, that, I didn't choose it. I was also given that name. Hannah was the mother of Samuel. Samuel, the great prophet, who um, anointed David. And um, it was very, very important. So uh, tell us about maybe how you chose that name. Yeah, um, another interesting story. So when I was going to make the first trip to Israel, um, I wanted to come and I wanted to know my Hebrew name. Now I hadn't yet done the conversion, but you know, of course it was meant to be. And um, so when I came here, I didn't want to use my American name. I wanted to use my Hebrew name while I was studying here. So I, I told Hashem, I said, can you show me what my Hebrew name is because I want to use it in Israel. So I had about a month to go till the trip. And uh, first I went to see this play 
by a friend uh, that a friend of mine was acting in. It was a one 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 woman play on Han the life of Hannah Senesh. Hannah Senesh uh, was a was a teenage hero uh, during the time of the Holocaust. She was in uh, she was safe here in Palestine, uh, which was it was then called Palestine. She volunteered to go help her fellow Czech Jews. She was from Czechoslovakia then. She volunteered to go into Nazi occupied territory to help the Jews. As a as a parachute. As a parachute. A woman parachute. And they caught her and they tortured her. And uh, she was truly a great being, also a great poet. Yeah. And a teenager when she died. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I was I was very inspired by that play and finding out about her life story. Um, besides the fact that my friend did an excellent job with the play, um, I it's a very inspirational story. So when after I saw it the first time, I thought I saw it two times in a row. And, and you I made a movie about the life of Hannah. So oh, I'll have to check out an English language movie. movie. But then I thought I thought well maybe Hannah is my name, and I thought well it was a really good play. It's a very inspirational story. So. I need to, um, I'm not sure yet, you know, I'm not sure yet. So then um, another week or two later, I went to Chabad and I went in the bookstore. And, um, you know, sometimes when you go in a bookstore and like you're just called over to a certain section and you reach for a book and you open and you read something and it's relevant to you at the moment. So I, I reached for this book, um, a Jewish women's book, and I opened to the page about Hannah in the Bible, who she was a person... Um, who uh, went into deep, deep prayer, and um, she was praying uh, very deeply and kind of moving her lips a little bit as she was praying, and the rabbi at that time came over and uh, scolded her for being drunk or something, and she yes. was like, no, I'm not drunk, I'm praying very deeply, you know, for a son, because I can't have a son. Um, so I read her story, and I related to that, because I, I kind of, I think I kind of pray in that same way, like, really, I really think you deeply. do. Yeah, yeah. When I'm doing healing work, I'm praying really, really deeply because I know it's not me. You know, what can I do? I'm human, but I know uh, the healing comes from God, and, and so I'm just asking for what, whatever the person needs that I'm working with. So, um, so then I really start to consider Hannah. Maybe this is the name. Oh, oh, yeah. But then there. So it took three times though. So then uh, the, the time when I, the, the thing that happened next that I was really sure that my name was Hannah was that I went to a festival in Phoenix celebrating the Israeli Independence Day at the Jewish Community Center. And there were a lot of booths set up with um, artists and, you know, arts and crafts and food and different things. So I went to the booth of um, this one artist and she had very uh, beautiful whimsical artwork and pottery and things. So um, I started to flip through her collection of prints. And she had these prints um, that they had different, uh, they were about different people in the Bible. And very colorful, very whimsical, really nice. So I flipped through and then I stopped at the print that was about Hannah. And I think, it, I think on the, around the edges it said in Hebrew, and Hannah prayed in her heart, which it says in the Bible. So I picked it up and it, again, got all the tears uh, coming down that I couldn't even speak. Uh, and I was like... Okay, I know this is my name, you know. Yeah. So I told the artist, I told the artist what was going on with me, and she hugged me, and she's like, "Oh, well, I'm, I'm so happy for you," and and you know, she could tell. I mean, something was happening. Now, for the first time, I really, really get it. How that name is you, you know, mm -hmm. that is, you are Hannah. Um, it felt, it felt, um, it felt right. So. Yeah. <laughs> so what a privilege. Uh, for me, uh, mm -hmm. Hannah. Okay, and um, okay. And how has it been? How has it been for your daughters? How has it been for you? Okay, yeah. So we'll talk about now. Now that we're in Israel. Yeah. Um. Well, at first, um, I was probably a little concerned, and also my family was concerned and friends. They they realized how Israel could be good for me, but they said, "Well, how is it going to be for your daughter?" She's starting high school. I have one other daughter in college in America, but I, the one that's with me is, was just starting high school this year. And then, of course, the obvious question I could ask is how do they feel about this whole Jewish thing and, uh, and yeah. coming to Israel? I mean, um, yeah, it was, you what, know, a, strange uh, thing, what <laughs> a strange thing for their mother to do, you know? Yeah. I mean, well, you know, I think, 
I think it was a little hard for them. Not that they had any objections, but when I received that message through my mother, um, actually that helped because I said, remember when you typed uh, this? <laughs> okay, you were involved in this. So what? like, if there was somebody else, she might have said, well, that sounds crazy. But her hands typed the message. Actually, maybe that's why it came through her. Mm -hmm. I hadn't thought about that. And um, so um, I told her, I think I told her that I was doing the conversion and making and wanting to make the Aliyah. I think I told it all in the same conversation. So <laughs> it was probably a lot. Um, so that, not that they have any objections. Um, my mom's best friend when we were growing up was Jewish and she was very familiar with Judaism. And my parents aren't religious, but they have uh, respect for Judaism. Like what, Catholic or what? Um, no, they were just like not really religious in any okay. sense. But um, she just has a respect for Judaism because um, she, her best friend was Jewish for many years when we were all small. And we got together, played with our kids okay. all the time. And she had many Jewish friends. And um, she, I think she told me when I first told her, she said, no, Judaism, that's the best uh, religion on the earth. And I was like, you know, somebody that's not religious. I'm like, really? Where do you get that information from? And she said, no, you remember my best friend. Uh, she was Jewish. She was Orthodox Jew. And so I know a lot about Judaism. And so, you know, that felt good. Um, but, you know, to th hear that your grandchild, your granddaughter is going to be taken so far away. Yes. You know, hard, indeed, so, indeed. Um, yeah, they had, it took them uh, a little time to kind of just adjust uh, to the idea. So. And, and you leave it up to the, your girls, what they want to do, if they want to be Jewish. Yeah. Or if they want to be whatever they want to be, you don't. Oh, for sure, yeah. Um, again, even if it's your own family, you don't uh, try to recruit people into Judaism. I mean, That's right. It's, very, it's a very serious thing. I mean, in Judaism, we believe that um, once you do the conversion and you do a ritual bath, um, so mikveh. it's called the mikveh, and that once you do that, um, you have a soul transformation. So it, and that's permanent. So it's it's a big decision. You really have to be exactly. sure mm -hmm. because it's uh, it's permanent. You can't um, can't like undo it afterwards. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, a lot of things in life you can. You can get married. You can get divorced. You know, but um, this you is can't forever. Undo <laughs> you can't undo. <laughs> you can't undo yourself. Okay. So. Um, my daughters, um, I, all along I've always shared everything that I was learning with them. Um, they've done all the different types of healing I did and um, very open-minded and actually um, two girls who are very connected to wisdom themselves and um, we've been like a, more like a study group, um, each bringing wow. ideas and sharing wow. with each other. Wow. Yeah, because you know kids have access to, like they're still connected to wisdom and if adults realize that, we can we can learn from them and we can listen to them. You bet. Yeah. So I um, I guess since I was studying spiritual things, I was uh, introduced to that idea early on, and um, they um, they would often share things with me, and they would have meditation experiences, and and so um, I would listen to them, and we we helped each other. You know, we helped each other. It was like a, a group effort. Beautiful. Yeah. So how has it been? Well, uh, I was surprised. You know, I've made big moves before. I mean, I went to Puerto Rico. I came back to America. I, I've traveled in Europe when I was a student, and I've made some big moves before. But uh, uh, coming to Israel, it, it was really challenging, and I was surprised. Um, I think there's something about it, um, maybe on the spirit level, that it's uh, it's just like this challenging thing you have to push your way into, maybe. maybe um, so. it was It was hard, I guess culture shock and um, I don't know I, I'm still a little perplexed but it was tough at the beginning and the first uh, few weeks and months I was here I just kept kept telling myself okay you don't have to stay you don't have to stay uh. just to comfort myself because there are a lot of challenges and um, I only know I only know a little bit of the language and I'm, I'm learning now um, so that's also hard. I mean, I would go to the bank to open a bank account, and I couldn't find anyone who speaks who English. Spoke English, and um, the bank accounts are different, and it just felt felt really uncomfortable. It felt like walking around like with a blindfold and like earplugs, and trying to have a normal life. Yes, it's hard. And a lot of people that come, they already have family here or friends, and so I think that the additional challenge for me was that I came by myself, you know. But so you came with Shalom. Um, well, Shalom, actually, yeah, Shalom came in the same, maybe in the same month, but at least the same summer. That, yeah, that helped, and I've told him many times that um, 
Um, him, he, he's basically a returning Israeli because he lived here 25 years, and he was also making, trying to make the decision when to come back. So it happened by coincidence. We were both coming the same summer. So again, we were able to help each other out. Yeah, good, good. Yeah, so now we call him Uncle. He's uh, such a close friend, and um, yeah, continue to give each other support. So, okay. Yeah. Um, this is uh, an amazing story. It's uh, an Abrahamic, huh? an Abrahamic story, and um, and uh, I just <laughs> want to thank you. Thank yeah. you for sharing. You're welcome. You know, it's funny because before I started talking to you the last uh, few weeks or months, um, I didn't really realize that I had all these stories, you know. I just little by little would share things with you, and then after a while you're like, wow, you have so many stories. I was like, well, I guess I do. Like, I didn't even realize it, you know. So it's been kind of uh, interesting for me to click them all together and share them. And Okay. Um, and I, I have to say that... Um, my inspiration also for sharing them is I think I want people to realize that that God is here with us um, offering a lot of um, guidance all the time we just have to have our eyes and ears and heart open yes. and uh, we're not here alone and there's a lot of guidance and um, we are supported and and uh, helped along the way um, and God's here with us every moment everywhere like That's for you, God, I, God yeah. is, is sort of like a friend. Isn't yeah, that right? yeah. That's yeah. one. Of, that's one of the names of the books of uh, Neil Donald Walsh, who wrote Conversations with God. One of his books is called Friendship with God. Mm. And what a what a wonderful place to get to in life, where you mm. can say that you have that. And yeah. Hannah, I think you do have that. Oh, oh, thanks. Well, um, I have to say also in City Yoga, um, Guru Mai has a book called, um, I can't remember if it's a book or, or a, it's a talk, but the title is uh, God is My Constant Companion. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, even now, you know, I'm starting my healing practice and um, mostly living off savings and I'm, I still have to tell myself, okay, don't get nervous, um, Hashem's going to take care of it, everything. He's not going to bring me all the way here with all these miraculous things and just drop me. <laughs> You know, I mean, he'll bring me work, and actually, I'm um, getting married um, Thursday. Amazing. And On so, a very sacred yeah. day yeah, uh, uh, for yeah. Jewish people. Yeah. Like and I, Omer. I wanted to find a husband when I got to Israel, so um, I found my partner. So, um, yeah, I, um, I, I still, I feel that um, God is with me, and... Um, yeah, he's he's always there. He's always there. He better be, or you'll kick the bath. Yeah, I'll kick something and leave a mark, and you know, <laughs> I'll be in big trouble again. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Hannah, thank you. Oh, thanks to you. It's been and nice sharing all this. And thank you all. Okay. Thanks.